Hello everyone, it's Robert McDermott again, this time talking about Plato, though I did take a talk on Plato earlier, a week or two ago. Uh, since then, uh, while preparing for Aristotle, I had some more thoughts. I said, hmm, I should have said this, I should have said that. Perhaps some of the thoughts that I will say today uh, are re repetitive of what I said a week or two ago, but I just want to build up Plato a little bit in all of his uh, confident brilliance uh, on the way to Aristotle, who begins as a student of Plato, uh, not just Plato's thought, but actually of Plato himself, uh, and then slowly um, sort of uh, shrinks or lowers the upper story in a way that is uh, more sensible, more practical, more uh, accessible, um, and uh, that's that's one of the great choices that we have. How far do we want to go with Plato, and if not all the way, all the way being the uh, divided line and then the theory of forms, the philosopher king, the allegory of the cave, all in the middle books of the Republic. If we don't want to go that far, how far can we go, <clears throat> or should we go? And or should we um, finish where the later Aristotle finishes with the, uh, the forms and uh, the good, the, um, the ultimate purpose of, of life uh, is uh, not so ambitious as Plato's, not so uh, lending toward the idea of um, two levels but where the two levels are really brought together. Uh, it's not totally flat. It's not like a 20th century uh, humanist, naturalist, uh, for whom there's only the human, or the earth and human, uh, but nothing like the Chinese Tao, or, or Plato's The Good, or capital or reason as there was for the Stoics, reason and nature being some um, some law of the cosmos which uh, guides uh, human beings whether they know it or not. So we all have this uh, invitation, beginning with Socrates, uh, to enter the philosophic life, to begin to think, to think and think and keep thinking until we get uh, some idea of what we want to, uh, what kind of idea, ideas, worldview, perspectives we want to guide our life and then to keep thinking and to make the revisions either because we're going from young adulthood to middle adulthood to older adulthood maybe to old age it's never okay to stop improving your philosophy because the philosophy determines your action at least the greeks were convinced that it did now that we've read freud maybe we're not so sure about the relationship between thinking and uh, and behavior because ever since Freud uh, we have to be conscious that our thinking might not be uh, might, might not be so um, uh, what shall we say believable because we lie to ourselves and we cover up and we are unconscious of our motives so thinking really comes into a, a very questionable uh, situation once we get to Freud and to 20th century psychology. So Socrates, Plato, Aristotle did not have that concern. They were convinced that thinking will lead to action and surely there's some truth to it. Freud didn't destroy that completely. He just let us know that we should be more careful and introspective about whether we really have uh, right to think that the reasons we give are really the reasons governing our action, or whether there are some other reasons, inaccessible in fact, pushed down deliberately to be uh, inaccessible, so that we feel freer and better to do what we really want to do, even though we're lying about the reasons. All that's very complicated, and not at all Socratic, or Platonic, or Aristotelian. They have the view that what we think leads directly to our action, and there's enough truth to that, I think, that we can proceed trying to get the best thoughts, the best ideas uh, in our mind, uh, 
though they, we may revise them nevertheless, we have to start. So we started with Socrates in search of a guide of action, a guide of morality, he calls in some translations, it's called piety, something that would stand still, that would be objective. He wasn't so much concerned about all people, he was concerned about all Athenians, which for him was pretty much all people. Uh, and so he was trying to get there and at the end of his life, uh, he said he was still searching and uh, that at least, but he did know what was just with respect to his being a citizen of Athens. Then we come to Plato, who was a young man when Socrates was executed and his early dialogues uh, were uh, Socratic in the sense that they were about Socrates' teachings and they didn't go much beyond what Socrates would have said had he been writing those dialogues. But then we go to a book such as The Republic, which I take to be at the, at the center, the, the peak really of, of Plato's uh, confident philosophizing. And there Plato answers the question, what is the good or what is the objective end of human life? What is the ground, the foundation of virtue? And he says, it is the good and the good is the is the ultimate transcendent reality, which is knowable for by someone who lives the philosophic life, who spends a life searching the up and up from ordinary um, uh, uh, fleeting uh, perceptions and fleeting thoughts to enduring thoughts to criteria that can help organize and and um, uh, in, uh, organize and and illumine our actions or the actions of those around us uh, and then to abstract concepts like love, uh, beauty, justice uh, and then the, the good which holds those three uh, and is the source of those three. So we build up from ordinary events, ordinary moments to these ultimate uh, infinite and eternal realities uh, and then we see that once we get there, we trace them down into the, into the ordinary, the practical, and the fleeting. So that it's very hierarchical, and the, the, the best is at the top, and the least valuable is at the bottom. Okay, now one of the exciting um, processes or uh, struggles that Plato had was how does he get those philosophic ideas to organize a state which could then be just instead of a state that was controlled by rich people trying to get more riches and who would put uh, uh, put to death anybody who questioned them, which is of course what happened with his teacher Socrates. So <coughs> he says, well, in order to do this to work, we would need to have the philosopher, the person who spends his or her life, and he did mean his, uh, though he did have the equality of men and women, uh, he's clearly picturing a male uh, as being probably more likely to be successful uh, in, uh, in classical civilization, particularly in Athens. Uh, so the philosopher king would be someone who had who studied his whole life, inquired, uh, entered into dialectic, the back and forth of answers, and questions, answers, questions, answers, until that person would get a knowledge, would get insight concerning the ultimate structure of the world, and would have reliable knowledge about human affairs, human behavior. If that person who did that philosophic, who, who lived that philosophic life, were to get power, but to be not just a philosopher but a king, it's possible that that person with the knowledge that he had uh, could organize the guardians, the people in, who are actually running the society, and they could partake in the philosophic wisdom that the philosopher king embodies, and they would then bring about the harmony of the parts of the state and the harmony of each individual in the state. So he divides these, the state and the, and the individual into three parts, the, the philosophic, the rational, the, the thinking part, and then the, uh, the uh, more spirited part, uh, which we might call the feeling part, 
and then the third part is uh, the appetitive and the um, basically the life of a of a, a, a laborer, a person who um, has um, very important but limited uh, aspirations. Basically, that person uh, is paying attention to work and to uh, uh, and to food and sex and it's a completely physical life and Plato says there are such people and that's really what they want uh, and they're born they're born with that nature so he has these these kind of uh, metals gold uh, and um, uh, silver and and um, a bronze as different kinds of persons and he wants to, all these these three types to be happy to be in the state in a way that uh, the state is just and they have a, a just harmonious relationship between those parts. Now, uh, we, last time we talked a little bit about the, the cave. That would be uh, the, the story which tells what would happen if somebody uh, claim to have this knowledge which could then basically construct and sustain the justice of the state. And you recall Plato says the person would go out, and of course he's thinking of Socrates, and he would go out and look at the sun and say, whoa, that's the real thing. That's not shadows on a wall, that's reality. And that's transcendent and it's right there. It's, uh, it's always there and we should uh, see that as the reality and not a lot of shadows um, behind uh, bodies, um, and the, the shadows on, a, on the wall of the cave. And then Plato has this person go back in and try to tell the people in the cave what they're missing and it's all different, it's totally different. You're living in a world of shadows when you should be living in a, in a, wor in a world of reality. And then the answer comes, it, that person, let's say Socrates, tried to tell those people what they were missing and what the real reality that Plato thinks he has found, they would kill him. So now Plato then is the one who with pure philosophic um, capacity and dedication, not with a revelation, not with the Hebrew scriptures, not with the Christian scriptures, which of course come after anyway, uh, but not any kind of of uh, dogmatic uh, religious uh, uh, revelation, but purely on the strength of his dedicated thinking, comes to this world of transcendent forms or ideas, realities that uh, ray down on, onto all particulars. And when that comes into Christianity, uh, beginning with John's Gospel, who talks about the Logos, and then particularly in Augustine, uh, who uh, is uh, schooled in Neoplatonic philosophy, philosophy mostly from Plotinus, which comes six centuries after Plato, but it's, it's very thoroughly Platonic. Uh, the uh, Augustine and uh, other uh, fathers of the church then speak about these ideal forms, ideas, uh, transcendent values as being in the mind of God and that created, shaped the whole of creation, but particularly the uh, na human nature, which is uh, a, a seed, a spark, a, uh, um, a fragment of, of God's own nature, which of course includes uh, which is the good and includes the uh, values included in the good, love, truth, beauty, and in more than justice, it's uh, really love uh, replaces justice as a, as a, um, a divine uh, quality, whereas justice is uh, right and correct. Um, love is even more than right and correct, it goes the extra um, and in sense of uh, giving to, to another what is more than just but comes out of benevolence or um, a, um, a desire to, uh, uh, to help one, help another the way one would help oneself. Okay, so Plato um, finishes the Republic saying it is possible to have a philosopher king 
who would combine knowledge and power in a way that could then structure the society uh, in, in, in sort of the uh, justice which is harmony for all of the individuals. And of course, then you would have to have control of the educational system. And so you could say that the Republic is actually a philosophy of education. It's, uh, it's a paideia. It is a treatment of the ideals of society, ideals of the just society, ideals of the ideal uh, society. Great word, paideia. P-A-I-D-E-I-A. -E -E and uh, so that's the sort of the ultimate philosophic uh, claim or vision. And Plato, at the end of his life, it, it writes what's called the, what, yeah, guess what, it is, he didn't call it, but someone else, scholars call the seventh letter. Originally, they weren't so sure it was Plato's that it was decided that it was. And in that letter, Plato says that uh, after a lifetime of thinking, the, a person could reach a kind of a flaming insight, could reach some kind of intuition, some the, that the reality would kind of rise up and present itself to a person who is seeking, not to a person who is not seeking, uh, but rather to a, a person who is, is, is looking and training the mind and controlling the senses, uh, has a kind of a meditative intellect that can receive not the revelation uh, in a religion, but a revelation, nevertheless, and maybe a revelation that is has many of the same qualities as get incorporated into a religion. So you see, it's a short step from Plato's uh, the middle of Plato's Republic to the early centuries of uh, Christianity. Uh, not so much well, the Judaism. Um, and Christianity have a lot in common uh, when uh, in the uh, Middle Ages, but actually Islam first, and then and then Christianity when they're both trying to compare and reconcile really their their scriptures. The, um, the uh, Maimonides is doing the Hebrew scripture, and the uh, at the center of Veroese is doing the uh, Quran and Thomas Aquinas is reconciling uh, the New Testament all with Aristotle who now becomes uh, not a replacement for Plato but a mm, what a, a revision a refinement a, um, a, a different philosophic mentality a mentality which is uh, more um, willing to uh, invest in the immediate, the particular, uh, and uh, particularly in diversity, in, in the variety of possible answers and, and possible qualities that are to be prized. So Thomas Aquinas doesn't stop being a, uh, a Platonist. He still has the ideals that are from God. Um, and that they are governing of human life, but he's much more impressed than Plato or Plotinus or Augustine with the, the close relationship between the ideal form, the divine, and the human. So he doesn't, he's not, <laughs> he's a Catholic, he's not a Protestant. He doesn't uh, have this strong sense of the fall that you find uh, in Augustine. It's rather, it's a very healthy-minded uh, Christianity. So, but to know, to enjoy all that, uh, and it is enjoyable to think about him trying to reconcile Plato and Aristotle and the New Testament, uh, you need to know about Aristotle. And that is the next uh, lecture when we talk about uh, the sort of the general character of Aristotle's thought and then uh, get ready to discuss the, um, uh, the ethics, Nicomachean ethics, uh, which is uh, Aristotle's revision of Platonic ethics. So the good comes uh, into human life, into even into ordinary life, but you'll see there's still a remnant of, of Plato. So that's next time, Aristotle.